Good evening. Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1. I agree with Keith. It's good seeing folks. It's also good seeing folks that I saw 25 and 30 years ago. You know, and I always find that to be an encouraging thing. And it's, and it's also interesting uh, to see how we each have uh, journeyed in our understanding in the dispensation of the, of the grace of God and the principles. And, you know, it's, uh, we used to uh, sort of joke about the fact that as, as we studied, we must be looking at each other's notes because you might be removed by geography and you get together and you find out that you're teaching on the same subjects and studying the same subjects and, and uh, usually coming to pretty close to the same conclusions. And so it's... Uh, when I get to get together with uh, folks that I've known over the years, I find it to be quite exciting. Ephesians chapter 1. I can't just start reading in verse 9, so we're going to start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded together, uh, hath abounded toward us in all wisdom, and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we just thank you for the assembly of saints here, for our common uh, understanding uh, of your Savior, our common identification with your Savior, for the truth of your grace, and uh, just for the fellowship around everything that we share in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that everything here would be done to thy honor and glory for the edification of the saints. And we pray in the name of our Savior. Amen. Understanding God's will. That's a big subject, isn't it? <laughs> well, at least it, it is to me. And it, Paul tells us here that it pleased God, it was his pleasure to make known unto us the, the mystery of his will, the secret of his will. You know, when you start <coughs> talking about God's will in, in most circles, you, you can really find some interesting viewpoints about God's will, I know generally before I um, put together a message, one of the things I like to do is I like to go and, <laughs> and mine the uh, illustration databases. You, you preachers know what I'm talking about. You're always looking for different illustrations. Well, I, I challenge you to do something, and that's to go and start looking for illustrations on understanding God's will you'll find that it's extremely challenging. Most of them come from one of two viewpoints. It's either the Calvinistic side or the uh, Arminian side. And uh, just to give you sort of a spin, I picked out a couple, just to give you an idea of where most people come from on this particular subject. The first side <coughs> is the Calvinistic side. And... Uh, Basically, their idea about uh, understanding God's will and God's will is that it's inevitable and implacable. Uh, you just learn to accept it. And uh, the illustration goes as this. is that a good pilot must have a healthy fear of gravity. This respect is not in the conscious mind of most pilots, but it forms the foundation of everything they do. When a headstrong pilot comes up against gravity, gravity will win, no matter how strongly the pilot opposes it. A pilot who does not respect gravity is not around to tell us about it. In a sense, this uh, particular writer says, uh, the healthy respect of gravity is similar to our living in submission to God's sovereign will 
Ultimately, whether or not we choose to accept it, God's will wins out. Sounds kind of good, doesn't it? Yeah, there's, there's a period of time I probably would, would have agreed with this particular illustration. And then we'll look at it a little bit further if we go on. The other side is more the Arminian side. And of course, to them, God's will is uh, more mysterious and elusive. It's something that you have to sort of look for. And uh, the illustration that I found I thought was kind of interesting. It speaks about a certain harbor that was treacherous and dangerous. In order for the captain to guide his ship safely into this harbor, he had to be very attentive to the three lights that were used to guide him. When all three lights lined up as one, he knew it was safe to proceed. Then and only then would he be able to bring his ship safely to port. And again, this writer suggests as we seek guidance, we too have to be attentive to three lights that are used to guide us into the harbor of God's will. The word of God, outward circumstances, and our inner conviction. When all three of these lights line up, we can proceed with assurance that we will be led safely into harbor. Well, now that's an interesting illustration, isn't it? And again, does, that, does it sound pretty good on the surface? Yeah, it does. But can you begin to see some of the problems of that? It becomes highly subjective. You know, we look at the Word of God, and it gives instruction to us. But do we temper what we know and understand from the Word of God based upon the way we feel about it? I don't think so. So, anyway, these, these are some of the ideas that people have. Discussions concerning understand God's will usually get kind of balled up in differing perception of God's sovereignty. And they'll try and make that the key issue. Um, I remember as uh, I was in college my first year hearing a number of discussions and they've always tried to resolve the issue of the, of the, uh, the two points about man's will and God's will. Uh, can, the Calvinists don't really believe that a man can have free will. And of course the Arminians believe that it's all about free will. And uh, the illustration they would give is kind of like standing on a railroad track and you look down and you see two rails but if you look off into the distance they become one and well you know there's something I know about railroad tracks <laughs> they don't ever join together I don't care what they look like those are two entirely different ideas as way of personal testimony I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 12 years old and uh, I was saved in a denominational church but I heard enough of the gospel to understand that uh, uh, I needed salvation. I couldn't save myself, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ was the one that, that provided everything that I needed in that. Uh, I was somewhat precocious, and as a young teen, I began to study the Word of God. And I found that I was dissatisfied with a lot of the things that I heard. Um, a lot of that was... Uh, satisfied as I was exposed to dispensational truth. And uh, I found that a, a lot of the issues concerning this issue of the will of God uh, are satisfied dispensationally. But uh, I was still, my thinking was still corrupted, if you will, by the teaching that I received, by being exposed to the people that were know, friends and family that you were close to, you went to church together, you served together, you went on visitation with, you sang in the choir, and, and, and their thoughts about God's will would be expressed, and, and I was influenced by that. And I find that, that uh, typically speaking, as people begin to consider the issue of God's will personally for their own lives, that their perceptions are circumstantially driven and not doctrinally motivated. And uh, you'll find that there's a great deal of, of um, um, that, the idea of emotion and the way that things feel. Um, I remember the illusion uh, that people would use in, in teaching concerning God's perfect will and, and God's permissive will. 
And again, it was always applied in, in a circumstantial way, um, geographically. You know, that was a good one. Am I living <laughs> where God wants me to live? You know, uh, employment. Am I doing what God wants me to do? How do, how do I discover what God really wants me to do? Uh, my service to God. Does God want me to be a, a and I remember the expression, full-time missionary, you know, to Africa, Africa for instance. Um, and, of course, the big one, matrimony. <laughs> uh, how many of you are, are wed to God's perfect choice for you? <laughs> Well, hey, I know, but I'll keep my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> you better, you better. Mm, yeah. Uh, well, my wife and I have this discussion. She says, I'm really blessed, and I said, I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> so I, I'm lucky that she feels that way. But uh, uh, this, this idea of, of, of searching out God's will, it was kind of like the quest for the Holy Grail. You remember the, you know, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, and, you know, they're looking for this, this thing, and it almost becomes uh, an obsession. Um, so you, you have that particular aspect about, you know, they're always looking and trying to discern what God's perfect will was for your life. Uh, I think in application for many, it all comes down to a, a superstition. It's like a, an irrational belief, uh, almost a quasi-religious uh, belief in and reverence uh, for actions or circumstances or rituals or emotions uh, that, you know, when you blend it all together in many people's mind, it, it's almost kind of like magic. And uh, it makes it difficult in how you want to make the choices in, in, in life and what you want to do. Also, you begin talking about God's will, and you also have the issues of, uh, of things that happen, bad things that happen. Do bad things happen? Sure they do. Loved ones die. Terrible accidents. Um, health issues. Uh, suffering man's inhumanity to man, <laughs> as, as some people would use the expression. And, and it's almost... What, what's almost universally the cry when faced with these types of difficult circumstances as it relates to understanding. I mean, we're talking about understanding God's will. And, and it's why. Why, God? And uh, a lot of people are, are distressed by this. Um, this need to examine every circumstance for a hint of divine direction or intervention in their life. Uh, to me, it's not unlike the practice of palm reading or astrology trying to predict future events. It's, it's nothing more than vain superstition. Of course, it can have its advantages if you take this particular approach. You know, if you're looking for understanding God's will through your circumstances, it could be like, uh, an overweight business uh, person, and he told his fellow associates that he had decided it was time for him to uh, shed a few pounds. Well, one morning, however, <coughs> he arrived at work carrying a gigantic coffee cake, <laughs> and his associates, uh, they scolded him, and he smiled, this cherubic smile, and he said, this is a very special coffee cake. He explained, he said, I accidentally drove by the bakery this morning, and there in the window were a host of goodies. He said, I felt that this was no accident, so I prayed, Lord, if you want me to have one of these delicious coffee cakes, let me have a parking place directly in front of the bakery. <laughs> and sure enough, he continued, the eighth time around the, the block, there it was. <laughs> Fortunately, discerning God's will is not that subjective, and it's not a, on the basis of feeling. So anyway, coming back to our text, the Apostle Paul tells us here in the dispensation of the fullness of times that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven 
and which are on earth, even in him. Well, we see this expression, heaven and, and earth, and uh, Pastor Ron referred to it. I think Des also referred to it. But talking about the twofold purpose of God. You know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You know, that's a very simple demarcation, but you can go down through the scriptures and see that God has a plan for both. We would say that this is a dispensational truth. Now, again, I don't have to insert the word dispensation because it's right there in my, in my text, although some people would look at it differently. Of course, the subject is understanding God's will, so what would be a requisite first before you could understand God's will? Well, you'd have to believe it, but wouldn't you have to know it first? See, and again, that seems to be the problem for most people. They don't really know what God's will is. And so consequently, how could they understand it? It's, again, it's something that, they, that they, uh, they look for. But we see that there is a, a period, and I say a period of time, a dispensation is not a period of time, but, you know, we live in time. One of the things that we need to understand is, is, is how God works in time. He's not bound by it. But we live a, a linear existence in time, so consequently God works in time. And, and, and through time, God has uh, different periods in which he works with man in different ways. Um, a dispensation is, is a stewardship. Uh, some people use the word uh, economy. Uh, but it's a, a way in which God is dealing with mankind. And the... Uh, other messages, you've probably heard references, and I know you've been exposed to it before, but in chapter 2, you know, Paul talks about three different periods of time. He talks about uh, time past in chapter 2 and verse 3. He talks about but now in chapter 2 and verse 13, and the, and the ages to come in chapter 2 and verse 7. And again, these all speak to different periods of time in which God is dealing with man in a different way. We also need to understand that God's methods change in time. While his character, his nature never changed, his, uh, his ways of dealing with mankind do. Uh, he has an overall purpose, but that, that is opposed to differing methods and programs, different, different commissions for, for different times, uh, different apostles, different gospels. You know, you had Adam. Adam was put on earth. Was he put here for no reason or was he put here for a reason? God had something that he chose and wanted to accomplish through Adam. Um, there was mankind in general. And of course, we know how that turned out. We saw the, the culmination of that in, in the Tower of Babel. Um, God comes along and he establishes a, a nation, nation, the nation of Israel. And there's a, a program and, and, a, and a means or a procedure uh, that God is dealing with mankind through the nation of Israel. And of course, then... During the age in which we live, we have the body of Christ. Well, Ephesians chapter 1 refers to the dispensation of the fullness of times, and it demonstrates that it's God's purpose to gather together in one all things in Christ. All things. All things. We talk about verses that make a difference. <laughs> this was a, a particular understanding that uh, at, I believe the first person Excuse me, the dry mouth that comes with diabetes is not fun. If you have it, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, Keith Blades, I heard Keith Blades in a, in a conference, much like this one, uh, I don't know, must have been some 30 years ago. And he talked about the all things and what they were. Because, you know, I think all things can be you know, kind of a nebulous term, isn't it? You know, all things. What do you mean? all things. Well, Paul is pretty consistent in the way that he uses it. Uh, go with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul writing to the Colossians in verse 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. 
for by him were what? All things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he's before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the church, the, uh, the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now, it says here that he created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, that's everything, isn't it? I, I don't have any problem with that. I understand that, the Lord Jesus Christ is in his role as creator. But is that the immediate context here? Here it said that there are all things that were created in heaven and earth, and then he refers to visible or invisible. Well, why would, why would we find that expression? How could, how could something be invisible? Well, if it were in heavenly places, would it be visible to us? No. If it were in earthly places, would it be visible to us? Yes. And God has, if God has a program and he has a plan for the earth and for heavenly places, um, would this sort of describe how that would look? He said, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Well, what are those? Well, we understand what government is and how it functions. It's talking about the structure and the way things, that, uh, way things work. Um, on, on earth, it's easy to understand. We just had an election. We, we went to the polls and stood in a booth and chose somebody, and, and somebody won, got elected. <laughs> They're now a part of, of the structure of our government. If I wanted to and, and I could get close enough, I could go see that person. Well, we find out from, from the Apostle Paul that in heavenly places that there is also structure. Uh, well, right now I can't go and, and, <laughs> and see those individuals. They're, in, they're invisible to me. And uh, they're in heavenly places. And, and that's, that's the point of Ephesians chapter 1, that there's going to be a point in time in which uh, these two uh, spheres, that which is earthly and that which is heavenly, is, is, is reconciled and, and put together in, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I, I found that to be exciting. And it's a study in and of itself trying to look at the different aspects in which we will be involved in the ages to come in that, uh, in that future economy, in that future time. But uh, one of the things that I've discovered, and I don't know exactly how uh, Keith intended me to cover this, but this is the way I'm going <laughs> to choose to address it, because I find that when I begin to study distinctions, when I begin looking at, at the twofold purpose of God and, I, and understand that God has a purpose for the earth and he has a purpose for heavenly places, you know, that, that enables me to uh, understand a lot of things in the Bible that before were difficult to understand. Many of you have experienced this and you know exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, but it seems in many circles that that is so much... Uh, an intellectual exercise. It's about understanding what's written in this book, but it's not necessarily something that's extremely practical in application. And so I'd like to, to come at it from that particular angle. As we refer to the earth, we see that God establishes the nation of Israel in an earthly agency. And there's a lot of terms that go along with that. You know, again, uh, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but Israel looks for what kind of, of inheritance? It, it's an earthly inheritance. Um, they, they look to inherit a kingdom. You look at their promises, and they're national in nature. Um, you see that that the law is very much involved in that particular kingdom program, that earthly program. And it's often the subject of what we would call 
prophecy. Again, and you've heard this statement, I'm sure, quite a few times. You know, the, a lot of people look at the greatest division in, in your Bible as be between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We've come to understand in studying that there's not much, there's not much division between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The one fulfills the other. The greatest division in your Bible is between that which is prophecy and that which is mystery. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. And he says that he's re um, made known unto us the mystery of his will, some secrets and, and about uh, what he's doing. We also find that as you, as you read about this earthly program that relates to the nation of Israel and, and her kingdom, and, and you find references to it, it'll be kind of like in Acts chapter 3, is that which has been spoken by all the holy prophets since the world began. The Apostle Paul talks about that which has been hidden but is now revealed. It was kept secret since the world began. But God established Israel in an earthly agency. You know, you go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 9. You might want to write, write these down because I'm not going to go to them. We don't have this, as I said, is a fairly big topic, and I, I can't go to all these references. But it, Israel is chosen to be above all people. Now, remember, God didn't chose them because they were the greatest. He chose them because they were the, the least. And he used them as, as an instrument, a vehicle of, uh, of making himself known and revealing his glory. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, we see that, that, that Israel is to be a kingdom of priests. Pastor Ron Knight referred to, uh, this morning to uh, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 4 and 6, where he's, he talks about them being called priests and, and, and ministers of our God. And indeed, Israel, in this particular uh, um, capacity, uh, had this type of agency. In Deuteronomy 28, uh, it says that they're to be the head and not the tail. Uh, you know what, you know. That's a pretty good illustration. You know, we, we use the, the term, you know, the tail wagging the dog. That's not the way it's supposed to work. It's the head that, 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 that controls things. And that was to be uh, symbolic of Israel's position on the earth and in the earth. Um, another passage, and I'd like you to go there. Go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 49. Isaiah, I wish this pulpit was a little bit bigger. I'd use a smaller Bible, but then I run into a problem. I can't read it. <laughs> uh, Isaiah 49, beginning in verse 3, And he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Again, there's that statement. God uh, uh, in glorifying himself through this particular nation. Uh, then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to, who? The Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. And, and Israel's agency for God, again, is, there was never any doubt that the Gentiles were to be included. That was God's will to, to, uh, to reconcile the whole planet to himself. Was, was that not uh, Adam's commission? Was he to do what? He was to to fill the earth, but he was also to subdue it. It, it was uh, political in nature. And uh, here we find that they are to be a light to the Gentiles, and this is a part of their agency, that uh, God's salvation would be proclaimed to all the earth. In time past, if you were a Gentile, and you did not come to Israel, where did that leave you? Yeah. 
Ephesians chapter 2, without God, without hope, strangers from the covenants. But can you imagine being without God in the world? That was not God's plan for the earth. And uh, again, Israel was to be his agency for the reconciliation of mankind. When you get to Revelation, you see the, the proclamation. And it, as uh, Israel says, Thou hast made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And uh, again, reigning in those positions of authority, those thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in the earthly sphere that part of God's program which is going to be reconciled to heavenly. Now, the church of which we are members, the body of Christ, is heavenly in focus and scope and application. Israel had a law. Well, we have law, but it's more like principles, <laughs> the principles of grace. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 6 that sin shall not have dominion in over you because you are not under the law but you are under grace and immediately when we start looking at uh, at differing agencies the church is God's agent in the dispensation of the grace of God as opposed to uh, uh, Israel as God's agent in the kingdom program and we begin to see how God's will works out in different uh, spheres of influence uh, Paul calls this particular truth the mystery it also relates to the period of time that he says is but now. That thing which was kept secret since the world began and it is now revealed. So you have heavenly people concerned with heavenly places. Uh, we read Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. He said he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Well, what kind of blessings was Israel blessed with? Well, they had spiritual blessings as well, but their promises were earthly. And they looked for an earthly kingdom. Their positions, those thrones, dominions, and principalities, and powers uh, that they're going to occupy are, are earthly in nature. Ours are heavenly. We too shall reign with Christ. But in heavenly places... And when and there in Colossians chapter 1, when he talks about reconciling all things to himself, he's talking about both programs. I think that's, that's an important understanding. You know, we make an awful lot about the distinctions between God's earthly program and his heavenly program. In the ages to come, I don't think that those distinctions make a whole lot of difference. You know when they really make a difference? Right now today and you know I think of God's purpose um, look at Galatians chapter 1 please Galatians chapter 1 Verse 3, he says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this, what? Present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Is it God's will that we be delivered from this present evil world? Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? Delivered in, in what sense? <laughs> See, some people think about escape and it's not really about escape it's about survival when you read Titus chapter 2 you see Paul writing to Titus about the fact that we should live godly where in this present evil world I wonder if a godly life is one of the ways in which we have been delivered from the present evil world rather than being influenced by it you know I look at passages of scripture like Philippians chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3 again many of these passages are extremely familiar to us where Paul says our conversation is where in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue, there's that phrase, all things unto himself. I've heard a lot of discussion about that word conversation. For our, con our conversation, what does that mean? Well, again, it, in looking at the language and, and you study it, this word, by the way, uh, is only used one place in, in Scripture in this sense. And uh, it comes from a word whose root deals with <coughs> the life of a citizen. That's the re You've heard somebody refer to this word. They say, our citizenship is in heaven. Well, this is verses where, where they get that, and that's, that's the origination of it and, and the idea. But uh, uh, we are a heavenly people, and our citizenship is not in this world. Uh, you ever thought about 2 Corinthians 5 when he, when he, says, when he talks about ambassadorship? Yeah. You know, what, do I, what do ambassadors do? Yeah, you think it's, you know, is it God's will that as a heavenly people that we function as ambassadors and in this present evil world? Yeah. You think that might, could also contribute to be a part of our deliverance from this present evil world? You know, I think that that very much is true. Um, but this, this heavenly position that we have being... Uh, blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, being seated with Christ in heavenly places, you know, it, it, it is an issue also of the way that we think and that we function. And it affects the way that we live. It, it's not just a, a doctrinal understanding to help us understand our Bible, but how we can survive with our faith intact, no matter what happens to us. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, if you then be risen with Christ, and we know that if we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are. It's an operation performed by, uh, by God when he baptized us into Christ. You know, we became identified completely with him in his, in his death, his burial, his, and his, his resurrection. And in the mind of God, we're already resurrected. You know, we are a resurrected people. But he says, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, where you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. You know, in our heavenly focus, we also discover that, that God has a will for us that we need to understand concerning the time in which we live. Um, does that help the way that we make our decisions? It better. Um, like I said, there were a lot of different ways that I could go, go with this. You know, you can look at the, the political aspects. And I, I choose to look at some of the, uh, what I would think would be more practical aspects. You know, when, as I look at Israel and her agency as God's agent, as, as the vehicle of God uh, manifesting himself to the earth, God dealt with Israel in specific manners in that dispensation. There were certain instructions, certain requirements, law, if you will. And, you know, we find that Israel's favor under that program was reflected in her circumstances. When she was, when she was obedient, well, it, um, if you want to write down the reference, Deuteronomy 11, verses uh, 26 through 28. God says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known, and, and so forth. But Israel's program, as, as they were to understand the will of God and to be God's agency, when they refused, when they did not obey, it was reflected in their circumstances. It didn't rain. Enemies came flooding through their borders. It carried them off as, 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 uh, as slaves. I mean, terrible things happened. Plagues. Because they refused to do the will of God and be the people that God wanted them to be. 
So her favor was reflected. Her favor with God was reflected in her circumstances. It, it even goes beyond that. You know, and, and again, these are dispensational distinctives that we're, that we're aware of. God also directed Israel through circumstances. You know, they, they, if they wanted to understand the will of God, a lot of times they looked at circumstances. You know, I think one of the uh, more interesting ones, look at Judges. Judges uh, chapter 6. Judges 6. You remember Gideon, don't you? Gideon wanted to know something about God's will. He wanted to know if it was God's will that Israel be delivered by his hand. <laughs> well, God told him it was. But he says, I want to know. He said, I, want, I really want to know what God's will is. And we read here, verse 37, he says, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and if it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And what did God do? And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and, and, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. <laughs> but then he really pushes it, and Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once, let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. <laughs> and God did so. You know, I tell you what, sometimes I wish I had a fleece. <laughs> know what I mean? No. Again, if we're trying to understand God's will... How can you understand something if you don't know it? So, you know, Gideon saying, I, you know, I, is this, do I understand you correctly? You know, do you ever, you ever ask God that question? Hey, God, do I really understand you correctly? Well, fortunately, our faith is not so subjective, it's more objective. We can go to the written truth of the, of Hmm. Yeah, it is found a resting place, you know. And and so, <coughs> as we seek to understand God's will, and we read the Apostle Paul, and we find out what points of that that will really is, uh, you know, we can we can live our lives according to that. We can, you know, make decisions based upon that. You know, I think of a. How about Romans twelve one and two? Have you ever thought about that? That verse, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what? What is that good and acceptable will of God? Hmm. That's pretty clear. So can I say in that instance, I know what God's will is? Is it God's will for me to be involved in service? Yeah. And, and, and how do I get comfortable with God's will? <laughs> how do I prove it? It's true. Yeah, it was, it's doing, doing, doing it, you know? And... But, you know, there's something also. About, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercy, that you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, under the, that earthly program, that kingdom program, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of choice in things. You know, you had 60, 640 some odd points of the law that directed the nation under that program. I mean, it, I mean it, it governed everything, you know, what they ate, what kind of cloth they could wear. I mean, all. Yeah. Every detail of their life, did they get to choose which one of those? I mean, yeah, well, we've got this law, 640 points. That, that's kind of that's much, God. I said, I'm, you know, I'm just going to... I'm going to pick out the ones I think are really important to you, and I'll keep those. Is that the way it worked? 
No. But we get to choose, do we not? We choose our service. And, and of course, there, like I said, there's, the subject is bigger than the time allowed. There's some things that, 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 that we have to understand about our service, where they, they, they function under this, this, this principle of law. Uh, we, pr we function under grace. We function, function uh, uh, from a different position. Uh, our, our service, for instance, uh, go with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And again, talking about verses that make a difference. First Corinthians chapter th three. I think Ron read this verse, these passages this morning. But as a young teen, it was verse ten. That's, you know how you ever that first verse that sort of smacked you between the eyes when it came to understand that something was different than what you'd been taught concerning how to to look at your Bible. So, well, this was the verse for me. He said in verse 9, We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build thereon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, that, you know, that's a pack of stuff. But I mean, either... either, either Either Paul is, is the most significant person of our age, or he's a kook. Because, again, and, and you know, we talk about the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It was different than what the apostles were preaching. It was different from that other program. Because the church was going to be a different agency. And, and our service, our, our, you know, and it goes on talking about rewards. You know, and how a man's words are going to be made manifest and how they're going to be judged. And you've got, you know, gold, silver, and precious stone and wood, hay, and stubble, and one is burned and the other is, is left. But that, that is all built. That, that foundation of, of Jesus Christ, according to the preaching of the revelation of the mystery, is, is the foundation for our works. If we want to understand God's will, then we have to understand that, that, that it's Pauline in nature. If I want to understand God's will for my life, I don't go back and look at the old program because it was different for them than it is for us. To me, I think that's what 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 is all about. And again, you know, we talk about the importance of knowing that verse because of, uh, of right division. You know, study to show thyself approved unto God. You know, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth well, we need to rightly divide the word of truth what is it that we're dividing if we don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth how in the world are we going to know or understand what God's will is for us and you take and you read a passage like that and I think that's what it's about you know, I used to think that that verse taught that, that I needed to study so that <clears throat> I could be approved that's not what it's about at all. I am approved. I am accepted in the beloved. That's, that's, and if you go back from our text in Ephesians chapter 1, that's the foundation where it works from. He, he has made us accepted in the beloved. And uh, does that affect my, my understanding concerning the will of God for me? Absolutely it does. That's the reason right division is so important. I, will, I am not going to find God's will for me in an Old Testament book. I'm not going to find it in the gospel. I'm going to find it in Romans through Philemon. Um, we read passages like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says that, that the man of God is truly furnished unto what? All good works. Did, did God create us? Did, did he, was it his... Did he ordain that we walk in good works? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Yeah. Uh, is that so that that's his will? Are we, are we up to that? See, that was, see, that's the other thing in understanding God's will. Could, could Israel really fulfill God's will using the law? Yeah. Can we fulfill God's will today? Yeah. He said the man of God may be 
perfect, truly furnished. Um, in First Thessalonians chapter th uh, two, verse thirteen, he talks about the Word of God that effectually works in us that believes. That's how the Spirit leads us. That's how we <laughs> come to an understanding of what God's will is, and are able to choose and be a part of that. You know, we uh, <laughs> we have a, a different philosophy, a different understanding. You're talking about feeling, you know, good, and, and there are feelings come into our, into our beliefs that we can't help that. Can you imagine being under the old program and the feeling that you got from being under the law? I mean, you're, 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 you're looking to please God. You're looking to understand his will, and, you, and here's this vehicle of the law to do it. You know, how, how do you feel about that? Hmm? Well, that's right. You don't want to get zapped because that was uh, the if then uh, then part of that. But you know, you take and you read the Apostle Paul in, in, in Colossians chapter two that there's this there's this operation of God where we're where we're circumcised, where we're baptized into the person of His Son, and 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 it says that we are what complete in Him. You know, under the old program, they had to be left com completely inadequate. I mean, I look at at the law and I, it's it's daunting yeah. but in Christ I can understand that I'm complete um, and, and this thing about <laughs> circumstances we go to, we go to the scriptures uh, the, the Holy Spirit leads us as, as we read what God's what purpose and his will by the way it's God who will have all men to be saved and come unto what knowledge, knowledge of the truth he said he's made known to us the mystery of his will. Uh, is that God's will? All right. So if I want to do God's will, if, if I was taking to read that, I said, well, you know, I can be a part of that. Am I, uh, do I understand God's will? I certainly know God's will because he tells me what it is right there, and I can be a part of it. I don't have to... Uh, Look for the proverbial Ouija board trying to determine what it is that God wants me to be about. You know, I think about Romans chapter 8, and we don't have time to spend much time there, but, you know, that verse that says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know, a lot of people go to that passage and they use it to justify. Uh, the circumstances of their life that they, they find themselves in with, with God's will. You know, something happens. They say, well, it was God's will. You know, and believers have a lot of uh, problems sometimes trying to reconcile the circumstances that they find themselves in with, uh, with their position in Christ. But I challenge you to go back and study that passage of Scripture. And... Uh, You'll find as, as far as, as, as dealing with the world around us and dealing with our circumstances, it's not a question. And, and you can read through there. You know, it says God is for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, I, can, I understand that it, it, a part of God's will is that he is for me. I don't need God to fix my circumstances because he fixed me. The question is, <laughs> is not about the circumstances we find our in, but ourselves in, but it's the quality of God's workmanship when he fixed us. You know, our circumstances are not, this is where I'm at my point on this, our circumstances are not a reflection of God's regard for us. And uh, th because a lot of people, you know, they say, well, <coughs> you know, I think God wants me to do this or God wants me to do that. I mean, you've heard people say that all the time. I've, I've had that delusion in my own mind in times past. And then they go about it, and the first time they hit a, 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 a roadblock of, of a circumstance, it's, oop, guess, guess that wasn't God's will after all, right? But, you know, we read Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory. We do what? We glory in tribulations also. 
think that's one of the things. When, when things happen, in the dispensation in which I live, we don't, we don't look for the fleece. We don't look for the signs and the miracles of, of Israel. We have a clear declaration of what God's regard is for us. Uh, we can glory in tribulations because we know that it's not God up there throwing darts at us because we did something we shouldn't have. God's will is that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. We can be a part of that. And uh, we don't have to understand that from the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, if you take and you read Romans 8, you find out and understand what God's will for our life is as we comprehend what his regard for us is. You know, it's his, it's his will that we be conformed to the image of his son. And by the way, you know, there's a theological teaching, you know. Do we want to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, commonly, people go to Romans chapter 8, and, you know, he said, well, you know, God's going to get his will in your life, and so he's going to use, character, uh, use uh, circumstances to create character in the life of believers. Is that true? Absolutely false. Now, I'm not saying that we don't gain character by the circumstances that we experience. But God's purpose, God's will for us is, is not to create character in us by the circumstances we find ourselves in, but rather by the life of his son. And uh, if you want to understand the will of God, it's, it's, it's discovering God's will <coughs> and studying the details of our approved status before God. It, it's about living and serving in light of that. Um, Ephesians chapter 5 and closing. Verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. By the way, does that sound as a, like a suggestion? Uh, you think that that, is it God's will for us to walk as the children of light? Yeah. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. But we're to be filled with the Spirit, are we not? And then if, if, as this takes place, it's what happens? Proving what is acceptable under the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. I thought we were delivered from this present evil world. We live in evil times. But we can be delivered through those evil times. Wherefore be ye not unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine where it is excess. But be filled with the spirit. Uh, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Is uh, a matter of walking in light of who we really are. In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's demonstrating righteousness and, and truth through God's life in us. It's proving, it's discerning what, what God really values and choosing to be a part of that. As we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. It's, n it's not an issue of circumstances. It's, it's, it's like the statement I heard Ricky say one time. He said, it's not where you are, it's who you are where you are that, that God is concerned with. We get hung up <laughs> on the physical side of things. God, is his will is concerning his life in us, the life of his son. It's living in life in, the, in resurrection power and yielding to Christ's life in us. And it's investing our life in the purposes of God's grace and not in earthly pursuits. Understanding God's will. We know what it is. It's God who will help all men to be saved. 
and come into the knowledge of the truth. Do we know that? Do we understand that? Then what's left? Just do it. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his offering for us, for his life now for us. And as we yield to that life, as we walk by the faith of Christ, may we walk a life that is pleasing to thee, fruitful in every way, as we live a life that's a testimony to the genuine grace that you have extended to all mankind. We again thank you for these dear saints and for the time that we've had together. And we pray in the name of our Savior. Amen.